Good morning, everyone. I've been asked to wait for two minutes, so I'm going to wait. I think they're just putting in some more stuff behind. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I think it was a great start to the event. Thank you all for coming on a Sunday morning. I know it was difficult for me. I appreciate you all coming here. I had an incentive. I have to come and talk. You're coming here to learn, which is even better. So thank you all for that. Uh, I think the clapping was a great energizer. Maybe we could do that once more till the bench seats are in place. Okay, so before we start off, I want everyone to just uh, raise hands when I ask a specific set of questions. I want to understand the audience better. And sorry, people in the other room or uh, who are connected online later on, uh, they might not be able to participate. But okay, how many developers in the room? Any developers? Few. Thank you. Uh, and there's no penalty or anything. I'm not going to pick on you, so don't worry. Feel free to raise your hands. Okay. Uh, project managers or program managers. Excellent. Okay. Uh, any other type of managers? <laughs> okay. Which one are we missing? Oh yeah, it's a QA event. I forgot the QA. QA. Too many. We need to uh, classify that in a better way. Manual testers, automation folks, DevOps, <coughs> unit testers, API testers. Oh, I see different hands coming up. Okay, interesting. Good. So we've got a good mix of roles over here. Uh, and thank you all for participating in that. And this is going to be very important for all these roles to be contributing towards this uh, conversation because what I'm going to talk about is not just for QA. Okay. Uh, so very quickly about myself, I'm Anand Bhagwa, been in the testing or slash quality space for about 20 years now. Uh, work with many great companies around the world, uh, product and services. And since last year, I'm doing freelance consulting and I'm working with various different organizations that bring in their specific needs. Okay, that's it uh, about me. Let's get started. Since majority of the folks are testers, but other roles, please feel free to contribute. What is this? Fountain pen. Okay. How would you test a fountain pen? Nisha, you've been a QA before, so you don't fit in the manager category. Okay. What are the different things you would want to test on a fountain pen? Right, ink, what about ink? Refilling ink. What else? First time if it opens. Size. Okay. Sorry? Leakage. Leakage. Okay. Color of ink. Does that matter to the pen? Okay. The right amount of ink coming out. Right amount of ink coming out. Probably can be equated with writing itself, right? Okay. Comfortable to hold. Okay. Sorry? Smoothness of writing. Okay. Does it matter on which surface you're writing for smoothness? That is also an important aspect, right? So, okay, I think we sort of get it. Uh, yes, you've established your keywords, you've got testing mindset. Okay. okay. Uh, that said, all the things that you spoke about, most of the things you spoke about are by looking at the pen. How many components are there in the pen? What else? Four components. Can you list the four components? Okay, the cap of yeah. Okay, and I would say you are on the right path, you are not correct. Why? Because if you really look at it and dissect the pen, there are many more components to it. There are probably more than five components in just the cap of the pen itself. Right? Now, when you talk about things like does it open correctly for opening, closing has to happen correctly first. If it doesn't close, then how will it open correct? And that's the problem of what you guys think about when it comes to functional testing. Okay? Because you tend to look at it only from what is delivered to you, not from what has been built. There is a reason I'm saying, not picking up on that specific. Uh, okay? But the point is, 
If you want to check if the pen is, uh, if the ink is going to leak or not, you need to ensure that the cartridge or if it has any other mechanism that fits correctly as per specification. It has been designed correctly. It can actually hold the quantity of ink that was designed uh, for uh, as part of the requirement. I should have five ml of ink that can be filled over here. If the component is not filled correctly, or rather it's not created correctly, the requirement says five ml. And you've got some robotic process. We are in the world of AI and robots, right? Some robotic process is going to assemble this by filling inks as well. If that component is not fit correctly, it has capacity of only 4.5 ml. What is going to happen? Ink is going to spin over there itself, right? So what I'm trying to drive at is it is not sufficient just to look at what the expected end product is. You need to understand how it has been built from ground up. And when you understand that, you'll be able to look at different complexities around which a cartridge. So how do I really fit that cartridge into the component over there so that it's going to be tight enough, yet easy to use and easy to replace or repair again if required. Right? So it is very important to look, to look beyond just what is uh, given to us from an uh, assembled product. And likewise, from a case of uh, our software products as well, right? Some sample website, doesn't matter which website it is, but there are potentially a lot of different components that have gone into building this. If you focus just on what has been the end product, you are going to be caught on the wrong foot. There will be a lot of problems that you might not even anticipate, which end up leaking up in your product. Okay? So understanding the details of how the product has been built is very important. Now, does it mean each person needs to understand each and everything? Of course not. You take any operating system or any complex product, any uh, enterprise product, these are huge, humongous products. I don't know why they have to be so huge, separate composition. But they are huge products. You cannot possibly know each and every detail of all of these. But for the area of your interest and the peripheral areas, wherever the job integration points are, you understand that well enough. You understand the design well enough, the thought process of how it has been built, why it has been built in that fashion is going to be very crucial for you to be able to test it better and develop better and of course give the requirements in a better way of course in the first place. right so that is important now none of this has got any relevance to what i need to talk about but it is a stepping stone okay now what all this means is in our world of ci cd we need to leverage automation to great effect to try and revalidate what was working earlier continues to work correct. That's what automation adds value. That's how it helps you move forward faster. That's what will help you test each different component in a better place at the source as quickly as possible. Right? And that's what the test automation pyramid really talks about. Right? Anyone not heard about the test automation pyramid? Excellent. So everyone knows about the test automation pyramid. Great. What it quickly, uh, just to uh, recap quickly, different types of tests based on the context of your application under test. Right? You've got these different types of tests because it's a pyramid uh, wide at the base, it means maximum number of tests are going to be at the bottom. Unit tests should be maximum uh, in quantity per set, number per set. And as you go up the pyramid, the number of tests should reduce. On the top of all these automated tests, there's also an activity of manual slash exploratory testing. I hate to use the word manual because it has got a very uh, traditional meaning to it. I hope no one does manual testing anymore. But I hope everyone does a lot of exploratory testing. And based on exploratory testing, you feed that learning back into what can be automated from a repeated perspective based on what is important to your product and make sure that is going to execute on every new change that is coming into your product. But do a lot of exploratory testing. Okay? This is what the quality of all these tests, the result of all these tests combined tell you what is the quality of your product. How many of you say that this product is ready for release by just looking at what your QA testing cycle is uh, saying? What about these other tests? Are you just assuming they are passing or you don't even care about it? That's a problem, right? Because each of these tests is going to give you some feedback about the product and the more you execute them for every change in the product, it will tell you what it means. The other aspect of the pyramid is that the time it takes to execute these tests keeps on going up as you go from bottom of the pyramid. Unit tests are extremely fast, literally thousands of tests can run within seconds. UI tests, the browser itself will not open within a few seconds. 
it's that kind of a difference that we are talking about, right? So the time to execute is going to keep increasing. The cost to implement and run these tests is going to keep increasing because now I need more and more of my product assembled and deployed and data set up and everything there in order to run my UI test for every small change that is happening. Versus for unit tests, I can run on a dive machine, etc. Right? So there's a lot of cost uh, involved with that. The aspect which is not realize very easily is the impact of the test on the product. How many of us just keep on writing UI tests once they are writing it? There is a framework, there is a tool, we just keep writing it. Right? The impact on the product is very important. The unit tests have the impact on the granular aspects of your product functionality. Implementation details. As you go up the pyramid, the UI test has the widest impact on the product. The behind gray inverted triangle is your product uh, impact, right? So UI test, the least number of tests should have the widest impact. What it means by granular test should be pushed down in the pyramid to get better validation done over it. Okay? Now this is your automation pyramid. Up to the web services side is your technology facing test. Above that is your business facing test, user centric. But this is what tells you what I should automate and not automate. Where I should automate and not automate. Okay? And that's where the different roles become very important to say QA saying, oh, these are important test cases or scenarios. But it doesn't make sense to automate at UI level developer. I'm sitting with you. Can you write more tests again? Okay? That is a very important aspect. The other aspects of the pyramid which are not very easily known or uh, relevant or apparent is security testing, uh, performance testing, as some of the NFRs, that automation also comes towards the quality of your product. And these tests potentially can sit at any layer in your pyramid. Certain algorithms, uh, very business-centric or uh, uh, intensive algorithms, might have a lot of unit tests from a performance perspective because it makes sense over there, right? Likewise, accessibility is another thing which is going to be there at a the UI level. Whatever you automate, that should add value to your product. And it will add value to your product only if you keep on re-executing these tests every time when the, uh, anything changes in your product. So when you have these tests automated, CI and CD is very logical. Right? In fact, automation is an enabler to CI and then to CD. Continuous integration and continuous delivery. Okay? This portion is also not very relevant. You might be thinking what is relevant so far. Okay? And that's what we are going to talk about. So what is missing in all this? What I've spoken about is nothing new. This information has been around for literally decade plus number of years. Right? Uh, I don't know if it's in a couple of decades, uh, but it is a well-known information. There's nothing new over there. But there's an aspect which is missing over here. Can anyone think about what that is? Usability. What about usability? No, I know what usability means. How is that part a missing piece over here? Because what we spoke over here, NFRs, I've listed three, but there are literally you know, quite a few number of NFRs, right? It doesn't make sense to put everything over here. Why is usability something that you think is missing? So, uh, So the, okay, so he's talking about quite a few things when it comes to usability. ROI does it uh, make sense to the business, to the users, right? That is usability testing, which is one part of one of the NFRs in certain ways, right? It is already part of NFRs. From the aspect of yeah, I think uh, this takes the UI. So we basically like check uh, the leak on the elements and all those things. But we don't check like how it is actually looking and so on and so forth. Absolutely. The look and feel aspect of it, right? All the other things, usability is extremely crucial. User experience is extremely crucial. User experience designs uh, actually come before the requirements itself, right? To do some user experience studies, designs, uh, talk to users and see how that really works out or not. Usability is, is it going to be usable uh, based on what we are thinking it's going to be uh, the, the, the over there, right? But the look and feel side of it, once it has been designed, developed, and tested functionally, does it still look and feel what I expected? And that is a part at least that uh, what we are focused on in this conversation is how do you ensure what was working well before 
continues to move on in now as well. Also, not just functionality, but also look and feel side of it. Okay, let's take an example. Anyone seen these kind of pens? Yeah. So in a uh, very simple ballpoint pen, and there are very different figures. You know, kids love it uh, because of different colors, shapes, and all that is there. Essentially, it's just a simple ballpoint pen. Very cheap quality. We are very dirt cheap over uh, in the market. But when I let's say the company when they designed it, it was looking at what is there on the left hand side. But over a period of time, maybe it starts losing color. Maybe it starts losing shape. How do you ensure that what was built and tested as uh, expected continues to do the same over a period of time as well? Maybe what I did is I started off with one pen design and then I said I want to add different color variants to it. But the minute I changed that color variants, maybe it started losing shape or color, whatever it might happen, and made some change. The aspect that we are focused on is from this perspective. What was expected and tested to be working uh, at one point in time continues to remain the same. This, in classical uh, testing terms, we call as regression, right? What was working earlier, I just want to regress the whole functionality and make sure it works fine. We are talking about it from a look and feel perspective. And this is uh, not really a surprise, but this happens in software as well. It's not just about physical products, it's all happens to software as well. For example, a case of UPS. These are real examples, okay? A UPS app on web works fine, on phones work fine, but when that app was tested on the tablet, the layout was completely broken, which means users would not really take actions based on whatever is supposed to be uh, showing up over here, that attract the packages or schedule delivery, whatever it might be. Okay? It can happen to any media based website as well. See over here, so for some reason, this main headline is longer than what was designed to be. That means it is now overlapping. Okay? Third example Amazon US. Some big global sale happening last year or the year before that. Functional tests all worked fine. The sale was launched, but surprise, they realized that the numbers are not going up. Instead, they're going down than uh, normal. When someone actually looked at it, they figured out the CSS was broken. What that meant is CSS broken. So, would you buy a uh, product from such a site? It is still functional. Would you buy it? Then, if it is some few hundred rupees, 200 rupees, okay, fine, I'll still take a chance, right? But if I have to buy a phone, 30,000, 40,000 rupees phone, would you take a chance? It has a big impact. Okay? And that is something that we need to be sure of what is happening as we continue doing incremental changes to our products. What happens over there from a look and feel perspective as well? Okay? And that is the part that we want, uh, I really think is a missing piece from all the focus on the testing side and developments on the testing side that are going on. Different kind of information techniques to test. This aspect, UX visual validation, is something that we need to focus on. Okay? Typically, how this is done? It's all done manually with the human eye. Whatever changes I'm doing, I'm taking, uh, running all my automation and everything, but I still need someone to manually go and look at that functionality every time a change in uh, the product happens. Across all the combinations of browsers, OSs, devices, viewport sizes, I have to manually go and check all of that. Is that an easy thing to do? Who likes doing that? Even if it is not easy, who likes doing that? It's a big challenge. It is a big challenge. Okay? And this is the part which I think is a very interesting aspect of how we can proceed in our tooling, in our approach of easing the pain from a UX validation, visual validation perspective. Okay? Before we talk about solutions, let's talk about, uh, let's make sure we all understand what are the typical challenges <coughs> in doing visual testing. First of all, we already spoke, it is mostly done manually. Right? What happens when you do this manually? Human error. Okay? It is also tedious. All those combinations, all viewport sizes, browser, OS combinations, uh, and all, it's a nightmare to work with in that sense, right? One or two combinations, yeah, great. But doing that repeatedly over and over again across all this, it's a big challenge. And the biggest challenge out of this is you can never really repeat this 
or scale this approach in your ci cd way of working there are organizations which do releases to production on every uh, build or every day or multiple times and whatever the frequency might be one of the days when we do one release in 6 months or 9 months or one and a half year one of those days right so how do you continue repeating this and this just does not work anymore from that perspective now functional automation can help a little bit in some cases right there are some tools which can potentially help out but it still is the first small step towards getting there most of the work is still to be done manually what do we mean by this we can run our functional automation test against all these combinations using some grid or cloud solution to run all different combinations and as part of all those you can take screenshots and then look at the screenshots to see what is happening over there so i don't have to manually execute the functionality in each and every case but look at the screenshots and try and make a difference so that's how functional automation can help a little bit but you still have to do all that analysis manually okay and what happens if we don't do this we already saw some examples right they can be business or revenue loss as in case of exam uh, amazon they can be brand or credibility loss as well right that uh, media side that we spoke about or think about it from a more relevant context let's say you have to buy a sony or a bose product right the first thing that you would do is you would probably go and find some reliable uh, site which has given information about the product one of the best sources is from the company itself right bose sony they have good material about the product on their websites how to go and research that and then i'll find out the best deal from which of place and i'll buy the product according right now imagine you have to buy a ultra full uh, hd tv i don't even know what is the latest tv maybe a 4k 8k whatever that might be the case you go to buy that and that's going to be at least 3 4 5 lakh rupees probably right if you have to buy that and you go to research on this uh, sony website and the sony website was broken would you ever think of spending that kind of money on buying the product you will need to get it in half price the brand reputation is at stake over here so whatever happens the company will ensure that the brand reputation is always maintained it is very important that it works fine in all network conditions all device os combinations right so brand credibility loss is a very important aspect out of it. and of course as a result you will lose your users of course right you would not be having your consumers so we spoken about the challenges let's look at some solutions as well okay has anyone done uh, visual testing before snapshot snapshot testing can you tell a little bit more about what that is So it's natural of the DOM. So, okay. So what he's saying is, uh, as uh, you run your unit test, you capture unit test how to capture the DOM, but we will talk about it later. Okay. But essentially, when you run the test, you capture the DOM. As you mean, it's a web product, of course. Capture the DOM, take a snapshot of it. Any change in the product, you take a snapshot again by the same test and compare that and see if the DOM itself is different. Okay. That is one aspect of uh, that. Uh, any other forms of visual testing that you have done? So the visual testing one. Sorry, I didn't get that. Max of JS. Okay, okay, Max of JS. Okay, so Galen and Max uh, of JS. Now Galen is a visual testing tool. Okay, that's a good tool to use. Uh, it is open source as well. You can use that. Uh, the other one I have not really used it, uh, but there are different tools. And uh, how do these tools work? What do these tools do? What about Pixel? It does pixel validation. Okay. Let's take a step back. How does it get to pixel validation? You compare screenshots. So essentially, your tool would have some way of capturing screenshots as your test is execution and is executing. And then you would compare the screenshot with what was expected. What is expected is typically called as a baseline. Right? You would compare the captured screenshot with the baseline, and you would compare. Is there any difference? How is the comparison happening? Either you can compare it at a whole page level, or you can say snippets of pages. I'm just interested in one particular region of my big page, right? I don't want to take a whole page. This approach is definitely very important, especially in single page applications. Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, single page applications in most cases, right? 
endless scrolling. You don't want to take full page screenshots over. So bear in mind what approach you are taking. So, but typically you would say that we take the screenshots and let me compare. Okay. Now we spoke about some of these tools, right? Galen and other ones. Uh, that is it. You spoke about the snapshot test. What are the typical challenges that you have seen in these tests when you are running these types of tests? So dynamic data becomes a big problem in some of the tools. Okay, any other challenge? What about you? Updating the snapshot. So maintaining the baselines basically, right? How do you keep that uh, in sync? Uh, there are challenges with the snapshot testing because when you do DOM snapshots, it doesn't include the CSS, right? And the look and feel is really going to come from CSS. So if your layout is breaking, you would not know even by doing that snapshot testing, right? That is another challenge. So what some of these result in is false positives or negatives. Because of dynamic data, my test has failed. But is that really a failure of the test? No, it's my baseline was incorrect when the new data came in, right? The product is working as expected. It's a false result that I'm getting that it's falsely classifying it as a failure. Okay. Baseline maintenance, big challenge. How do you really manage that? Uh, that is another aspect. What about baselines uh, for different browsers? My DOM is the same, CSS is the same, but when I really look at the screenshot, there will be certain differences in different browsers. Maybe the same browser across different OSs because rendering engines are different. Hardware might be different, which might cause some differences in the way the pixels are rendered on the screen. Okay, so how do you maintain the baseline across the browsers uh, and devices also for that matter, right? A five inch screen device, a phone, will have different resolutions, pixel densities, which means again the way the pixels are rendered is going to be different. And you really do that comparison. Or do you need separate baselines for each of these? That is a big challenge. The resolutions and viewports. So responsive apps, for example, how do you really manage that aspect, right? These are big challenges that are. Uh, and again, after all of these test executions, looking at the results, taking decisions on the results, and maintaining your tests accordingly. Let's say my product has naturally evolved into something else. How do I update my baselines? How do I tell these tests are now passed? Though there were differences, how to tell these tests are passed? Update the baselines and proceed. Right? These are big challenges in most of the tools that we have. Okay? So at this point in time, what I want to do is I want to shift focus and I want to, we've spoken about challenges uh, of not doing certain things and challenges of doing visual testing as well, using some tools. Now I want to give you a quick demo of one of the products called Apple Tools Eyes. Has anyone used Apple Tools before? Heard of it? Okay, a few people have uh, used it, heard of it, right? I want to do a quick demo of this and highlight why, what is the value of doing visual testing. Applitools is built using AI technology. The algorithms for comparing images is built, uh, has a lot of AI uh, built into it. And how is that AI actually adding value? Okay, so from a product context, what the earlier discussion was before this conversation, what is AI, how is it helping, what to be learn about it, right? It's a great use case of a product that is using AI to solve a real world problem. Second, how does that fit into your day to day working and how can it relieve some of the pain points that you have on the thing that we've spoken about? Okay. So let's take an example of Let's start off with a cross browser testing example. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Hopefully this works fine. Okay. So what we have over here is, this is the Apple tools dashboard. Some tests I've run over here already. The left side image is a baseline. Right side is a screenshot that was captured as part of test execution. This was taken on Windows 7 Chrome on a specific viewport size. The test, next time it ran, 
was on Windows 7 Internet Explorer on the same resolution. Okay. Now, if you look at it, can you notice differences? What are the differences? Yeah. Text is different. Some uh, layout changes across over there, right? Now, if I actually highlight now, uh, look at these side by side. And I'm actually going to first change the algorithm that I'm using for comparing. Okay. Now, if I highlight the differences, whatever is highlighted in pink is what the actual differences are at a pixel to pixel matching level. So though we did not really see as many differences, I think the differences that we saw mainly over here, right? And two other places as well. But most of the most apparent differences were here. But when you look at pixel to pixel comparison, I've taken screenshot as part of my test execution using Chrome and I on the same resolution, same machine. But when I do pixel to pixel comparison, these are the differences that it will find. Now what most of the tools will do is they allow you to configure the tolerance level, how much difference in pixel uh, rendering is okay, or you can say that uh, test is passed. In this case, it's a false uh, negative, right? It's marking it has failed, whereas I don't know if it has failed. So, this is where the AI algorithms of uh, AppliTools uh, kick in. If I change the algorithm to strict, it is now highlighting the differences only what the human eye can see as differences. Okay. If I put it one on top of the other, you will actually notice whatever is actually different to the human eye, those parts are there in pink. Now, I might say, any product owners over here, sorry? Product owners? Business analysts? Okay, one at least, right? A business analyst who's a pseudo product owner, right? Might say, I don't really care how this is rendered. This is just a message. I don't care how one browser renders it over the other. What is important is my brand logo. That is going to remain consistent. That is most important. Users are going to identify with paychecks. Not really with how that layout is, of which browser is rendering it from. I'm okay because the cost of making each and every of these pixels perfect in all combinations is very high. Okay? But as long as my logo is the same, I'm okay. So these differences in that context are also a false failure for me, right? I don't really want that to be flagged as a failure. So even though this is not dynamic data in cross browser conditions, it is going to be a challenge. Now, what some tools might be doing, right? They'll say Chrome, I will have a separate baseline. IE, I will have a separate baseline. Firefox, I will have a separate baseline. Same I'll do for each different types of OS browser combination. As well. And I have a separate such combination for different viewport sizes as well. Based on analytics, I'm seeing my users are on 1600 by 1600, 1200 by 1200, and 800 by 800. At least these are the top three viewports that have been there, right? So I want to make sure my product is designed based on these three viewports. But essentially, for the same page, you've got nine combinations right now. And that is going to be still very difficult to create the baseline and maintain it. One small change on the color of this button, or where this button is going to be, you have to update all of these baselines. So what we are able to do with Apple Tools is, we are trying to do Apple to Apple comparison, and supporting cross-browser as well to say, as long as certain parameters are the same, I still want to be able to do comparison across it, but I don't want this to be flagged as a fail. What is important over here to really make value out of this is if you change the algorithm to a layout algorithm, layout says that I don't care about the data or the content. Is the layout of my page correct? That is most important to me. And now you will see that there is only one failure that is not tagged over here as a visual failure. If I dig in deeper, we'll see that in Internet Explorer, the label of this button was missing. This is not dynamic data. This is not based on what the human can see or not, which is actual difference in your visual layer, uh, rendering that has happened. Your DOM snapshot would still be fine. There's a problem in the CSS file system. Okay? And that becomes a very powerful way to do visual testing. Now, Let's look at some uh, one another example over here.
let's take a native app example on android this is a yahoo finance app run the test run on the same device it's a data app right dynamic data the stock uh, listed is going to be different the numbers are definitely going to be different every time you run this you cannot control this data necessarily and if i highlight the differences using a strict algorithm what a human can see as differences these are the ones that you will find out are the differences over there okay now do you want your test to fail because of these differences and that's where again a good technology can help enable these things you change the layout or the algorithm to a layout algorithm and over here then over this loads up you will see that there is just one difference highlighted which was the actual defect that came up in the new build for some reason this button is not having the content inside it has not flagged any of the other dynamic content as a failure okay and that's where the ai part really kicks in there are a lot of other powerful uh, capabilities also of this tool okay this is not a tool demonstration i want to uh, tie it back to our automation and your functionality okay so for example we got three aspects over here now as i can prove maybe a product requirement is there should be equal gap on the left and right side left margin right margin and there should be equal gap between these two as well right so the dawn magic and as i can prove there should be equal spacing over there but that spacing is going to change dynamically based on the content of what these numbers inside are right so what again if that number changes the next time you run the test the test will mark that as a failure because that content has changed so what you could do is you can mark nasdaq as a floating region and when you mark it as a floating region you will see there are two boxes created outside it what we are essentially telling apple tools is as long as the inner box is within the bounds of the outer box mark this test as passed okay likewise if there are ads showing up i don't care about ads ads are being served by something else i could uh, mark another region this is where the ad is going to be i'm going to mark it as a ignore region so that region will always be excluded from doing a visual comparison but the point is if you do this change you have to save the baseline you have to update the baseline right accordingly and then save it that's how the next time a screenshot is captured and compared it will compare it with this see if you do not save it these changes are not okay so that is important one last thing i want to talk about apple tools as a functionality we spoke about automation and uh, ci cd right there are a lot of tests running over here you literally could be having hundreds or thousands of functional tests running across all these different combinations any new change in the product will will mean there will be a lot of visual changes that it detects the tool does not take decision for you whether this is right or wrong if there was a match it will show as passed otherwise it is going to show as unresolved unresolved means someone from the team who understands the context what the look and feel needs to be can come and take a decision on it but now i've got hundreds of these failures flagged i don't want to go and check each and every image and see what the difference is so what i could do is i will come into this different view i'm going to group the test the screenshots of the test execution by similar differences these similar differences are still going to go across browsers view ports and everything so they are not apple to apple comparison the ai engine will go through and see what are the common differences and out of the 76 unresolved steps that i had it has classified all the changes in two groups only which means if i now take decision on these two groups all my decisions for the uh, uh, unresolved tests have been taken so for example if i go into one of these and if i highlight the difference there is one difference i'm going to zoom in and over here i see that as part of a change in the new build that came across what the of the screenshots that were taken those pages had the different movements and that is a problem to me so i can quickly mark this region as a failure logo missing and i can fail the test snooze the failures till let's say fifth because the devs have now promised that they'll fix this by by the fifth 
I want to snooze the failures over there, or I can continue to run the test and fail it from that perspective. I can add some details. I can add and then take a look at this, assign the issue to a dev, and they'll get information about this. But the best part about this is if I now fail it, 40 of these tests have been marked as failed automatically. I don't have to go manually through each of them and do that. If I come back over here and look at the other one and I see the difference over here, I see the differences that the logo color has changed from black to green. But this is my expected functional change, for example, right? And if that is the case, there's no problem here. I'm going to save it. I accept this change. And when I accept it, I'm going to save this change. So the logo color changing, all those baselines automatically get updated to what is the new expectation. The next time the test runs, it will compare against the green one. The 40 have been marked as failure because over there the logo was black and it was missing. So there'll be two aspects to this. When the logo comes back, that test will pass or it will fail again because the color has changed to green. It is expected to be green. So it will be a two-step process. Which is fine, but the tool is making it easy to maintain and do those uh, uh, take actions on those. Okay. So what does this really mean, right? There are a lot of other features. I don't want to uh, make this happy to this demo. The important aspect over here is that we can now do visual validation, which is not really UX testing per se, but validating the user experience based on what was expected in an automated fashion. The way this visual validation typically works is when your functional tests are running, the executing functional test, let's say using WebDriver or using APM on uh, native, right? So executing functional tests, you're driving your product implement uh, execution the way the users would really be doing. Along with that, typically what you would be doing, you would take screenshots and then if the test fails, you look at the screenshots manually to see where it might have failed, right? Instead of that, you can integrate, if you integrate Apple tools, instead of saying driver.take screenshot, you would say Apple tools, check window or check uh, element. That will not just capture the information of the uh, screenshot, the DOM and CSS. It will send it to Apple Tools server. Using AI, it will do the comparison and get that information back. This happens asynchronously. So there will be a marginal increase in your uh, test execution time. But by the time, let's say your test you for 10 screenshots, by the time you are at the end of the test functionally, the results for first five, six have already come in. So you're just waiting very incremental value for result of the other uh, executions to come in. And then with those uh, execution results, you can say either I want to fail my test because there are visual failures. Functionally, everything is fine. But visually, uh, there is difference. Fail the test, so my CI build is going to be rest. There is a link to the Apple Tools dashboard where you can go and take a decision on it. Okay? So, moral of the story, we can do visual testing in an automated fashion. It doesn't take out the manual aspect of it. The human eye, the human context is extremely important. It's a tool. Tools can still give some false positives, negatives. But if you choose the tool wisely, it can ease the pain and challenges a lot about why most of the tools would fail from a visual perspective that we know of so far. About baseline maintenance, updation, and taking decision problems. Okay? Some references uh, for you. Again, these are well-known references about the uh, test pyramid uh, and uh, what uh, Alistair Scott has spoken about the anti-patterns of the pyramid. That's what I have referenced over here. And of course, the tool that I used was Aptitudes. So there's a link to that as well. Okay. So with that, I'm uh, done with what I wanted to quickly share about visual validation, the importance of it, and how you can bring it into your automation site. I don't know if you have time for questions, but... Uh, Oh, there are a few questions on there. Oh, like, like. Yeah. 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 I need to stop my sharing here. Right?